Um, first off, my sincere thanks to Dr. Abowith for that wonderful talk, and thanks to all of you for coming out on, again, a very cold, but at least not too snowy evening. <laughs> um, so for those of you who I haven't met yet, my name is Lauren Williams, and I recently took over responsibility for the Blackwood Natural History Collection. Um, the collection was established in 1920 through the efforts of Dr. Casey Wood. He was an ophthalmologist who, toward the end of his medical career, became fascinated with the study of bird vision. Um, so this led him toward beginning to collect works on ornithology, but his library soon grew to include material on all aspects of zoology. After it was donated to McGill, the collection continued to grow, and it now includes material covering all of the natural sciences from the medieval period right up to the 20th century. I'm so pleased that Dr. Abwiff was able to highlight a few of the books from Black for Wood in his talk, and so we've brought out a few of these works along with some other uh, stuff that I think might interest this crowd. Um, and we, as Natalie mentioned, we've got them on display out in the landing room. Um, so these include not only the first edition of Darwin's Origin of Species, but also the original publication of the Journal of the Linnaean Society, where Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace first discussed the idea of natural selection in their paper, which was almost a year before Origin of Species came out. <laughs> Excited to see that. <laughs> um, we also have a few other Darwin first editions on display, along with the incredible book detailing the many species of animal Darwin encountered on his voyage on the Beagle. Uh, we also certainly wouldn't want to overlook the ants, so we've brought out a couple of 17th and 18th century entomology works. Um, and uh, also as a special treat for this particular crowd, I've brought out a few plates from the Feather Book, which, uh, work, which is a work in which all 156 illustrations are created entirely out of bird feathers. This book was created in 1618, making these some of the oldest existing uh, bird specimens today. So <laughs> I encourage you to go and have a look at all these works in person, but I will reiterate what Natalie said at the beginning to please keep your snacks and wine away from the rare books. Um, finally, I just wanted to say how happy I am that this event has presented the unique opportunity to bring modern scientists into the same room as science historians and rare book people. Uh, these are groups that don't often overlap, but something I'd really like to emphasize through the Black Roy collection um, is the potential for historical materials to inform modern science research. Uh, Dr. Abu's work is a, a compelling example of this idea, and I think we could take it in many different exciting directions. Uh, as we saw, theories that were abandoned in the past due to technological limitations often uh, merit further consideration now uh, and can inspire really unique approaches to modern questions. So for those of you who have never been here before, uh, keep in mind that all the items you, you'll see today on display are available for any researchers to consult. Uh, and if you have any questions at all about the collections, please feel free to ask me and come back to see us again soon. So I will turn it over uh, to Dr. Abwiff again for <coughs> some questions if anybody has some follow-ups to the talk. In the very back there. Yes. I have a question about, I was trying to put myself in your researcher's shoes for eight years we're trying to create a, artificially create an army of... Uh, super soldier, yeah. A, a, a super soldier. Uh, what kept you going for eight years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then the second part of that question is you were able to recreate that from other species later on. Was that faster? <clears throat> Absolutely. Like once we got the first one, it was very much faster to find the other ones. We knew where to get the window. We just had to tweak it a little bit up and tweak it a little bit down. So once we got the first one, it was much faster to get the other ones. What kept us going for eight years? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, yeah, I ask myself that question sometimes too. My wife asked me that question. <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know how much longer, I, I'm ready to retire, but yeah, you know. <laughs> I think, you know, you can liken research sometimes to endurance sports, you know. You really have to have that mindset of a marathon swimmer, a marathon, like, you know, runner, or any of that kind of stuff. So what we know now is that by adding the hormone, 
what we figured out is that you're actually making those little vestiges that I showed you grow and they grow and they send signals and they literally make the head grow just balloon okay um, and the body size get much larger so the questions now are you know how is the hormone triggering the growth of these vestiges how are they receiving it what signals are these vestiges sending to the head and the body is it a direct signal is it through other parts that we don't know um, we you know exactly like how you know, those are all questions remaining questions that we have to figure out so yeah it's a real change in physical form and and I honestly think yeah that that's happening the, the problem is is this is all happening in the womb right these are all little windows in which vestiges are popping up and they're disappearing or hormones are popping up and you know in different little windows all over the place and it's very hard to detect and so that's why it hasn't been studied as much you know I think it'll have a dramatic effect in other organisms too. Yeah. Are, are any of these uh, vestiges that are um, super soldiers here creating being done within the context of a of a colony? I mean, and if they are, what are the other ants kind of reacting to these things they've never seen before? Yeah, so that's a brilliant question. You should come to my lab. You should do some <laughs> uh, but that's exactly it. Like once, you know, there, it's a big question, and, and, and Giovanna is kind of trying to get, make some roadway on this, is yeah, once you induce a super soldier that has, ne has been absent for millions of years, and all of a sudden it pops up in a colony, what? Well, the other answer are like, what? What, <laughs> what, what, what do we do with this? We, we haven't figured out the behavior of all of this. We have a bit of a tragic story. We, um, we had that anomaly that I showed, that large, the big large anomaly we found in Long Island. We brought it back to the lab. And I told my postdoc, this was over the weekend, I said, oh Misha, well, I don't, you know, you should check out the behavior. How is it working with all the other ants in the colony? You should just, you know, describe it. And he's like, yeah, I'll get to it on Monday. And I was like, no, no, I think you should really, you know, we have this, you should do it now. And over the weekend, some ants escaped from another colony, went into that colony and killed it. Right? <laughs> and so <laughs> that, that, that was really like a lost opportunity in science. But we, we're now we're trying to recreate them with the hormones. And now that we actually have an eye for them also, uh, we're actually able to spot them in the field much more commonly. So we'll get to that question eventually. Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, Do you know what the time window, like what happens in the time window to make them competent to become soldiers? Or, or what prevents it in other times? Like, do you yeah, that's a really good question. Like, what, what is actually happening in that critical window yeah. that makes it open to the hormone? That's a great question. Yeah, we don't know. And yeah, definitely. If you have any ideas, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that'll be awesome. Yeah? So that's a really good question. So, I mean, again, just to connect the two things together, it's just that those little vestiges, you know, uh, just to say that what we're, we're starting to come to, the reason why we think the super soldier program gets locked in for millions of years is because, you know, those little vestiges, those little wing vestiges, where they're the things that make the soldiers, right? They also make the super soldiers. And all Fidoli species have soldiers. So you can't get rid of the super soldier program without getting rid of the soldier program first. So as long as the soldier program is along and that mechanism is making the soldier program, it's preserving the super soldier program along with it for millions of years. And that's really what I think happens. That's how biology happens. You use the same hormone. We don't have that many hormones. It's like a few hormones that do all of these things in our bodies. Um, 
we have a few, like a, a lot less genes than you would expect that do a lot of different things. And so everything is hooked up in very different ways to everything else. And so unless you get rid of some processes, they hold other ones in place for a very long time. If anybody else has questions, I encourage you to just keep them in your head and talk about them over goodies in the next room. And I should introduce myself. I'm Jacqueline Sundberg. I'm one of the organizers of tonight's event. And I just have to say a few thank yous as we close here. Um, first off, though, I will say you all responded very well to the polls here. So I want to do another one. Straw poll. How many of you, this is your first time coming to Rare Books? Oh, great. Oh, welcome. And please do come back. You've given a great exposure to one, sorry, a new way of in interacting with the collections, as Lauren mentioned. So we invite you all to come back. But first, thank you very much to Professor Ehab, to Chris, and to Natalie for speaking tonight. And also thank you to the staff who are being invisible and setting up a reception. We have on camera Marta. We have me and Marion out in the, in the reading room setting up a reception for us. So a big thank you to them, because these events wouldn't happen without staff. And there is a good war representation here tonight. Library set people, do you want to raise a hand? It's got a good crowd here. So thank you as well for coming out. So yes, final note, thank you to Shirk for making this connection series possible and for allowing us to welcome all of you here in events like this one. And do please enjoy the reception and check out our book on your way out. It gives you a good taste of the other things that you can experience in the collection. So thank you to all and let's go have some goodies.